Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming back and joining me this morning here on Next on the T. We are brought to you today by the great folks over at the French Lick Resort, the PGA Tour Superstore, the Bobby Jones Company, Frogger Golf, and our new friends over at Orange Whip, makers of the Orange Whip Trainer. And, folks, you know, you've heard me bragging about, you know, Frogger Golf and their great array of products, and uh, I, I, I can't tell you how wonderful their stuff is, like their amphibian towel that won Best New Product at the PGA Merchandise Show back in 2009, or their catch latch technology that easily and securely attaches and releases, you know, your amphibian towel or your Brush Pro club cleaner, you know, from your golf bag right on, right off. It is a great, great product. So go check out all their great stuff at froggergolf.com. And let me also say, you know, how much I love the new Bobby Jones follow apparel. Please go to bobbyjones.com to take a look for yourself at all of their new arrivals. Plus, while you're on their site, you can still watch the playing lessons from Bobby Jones. Many of those lessons, folks, still hold true to today. And plus, you know, when you look at their apparel, the golf shirts and their sweaters, so soft and comfortable. They're going to keep you warm and, and looking great and feeling great, whether you're in the office or out on the golf course. So go to bobbyjones.com to see for yourself, you know, their, you know the stuff from Mr. Jones from back in the day, plus all the great new uh, golf apparel as well. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and this, and this morning I'm excited. i got two really great guests that are back with me that I'm looking forward to sharing with you over the next hour or so. And, and first up is going to be Russ Holden. And Russ is the founder for Caddy for a Cure, you know, plus one of the great caddies really of this era, having caddy for Bernard Longer and was a part of their 2004 uh, victorious European Ryder Cup team back at uh, Oakland Hills that uh, was played just right there outside of Detroit. And Russ is doing some great things with Caddy for a Cure. They've got a, a wonderful golf tournament coming up here in, uh, in the early part of December. So we'll talk about all of those things when Russ joins me here in just a few minutes. Following him, we'll get a long-awaited return from our good friend and 2003 PGA champion, Sean McKeel. It's been far too long since Sean has uh, joined me here on the show. So we'll get an inside-the-ropes look at the Ryder Cup from Sean. He was there and uh, got to walk inside the ropes. So some exciting times there, and we'll hear what that experience was like for Sean. Plus, we'll hear his memories and stories uh, from being around Arnold Palmer as we sort of continue our you know, month and a half long celebration of the life of Mr. Palmer. We'll hear Sean's stories for when he had some encounters and got to play with Mr. Palmer. So Sean will be uh, along with me a little bit later in this half hour. So we're going to hear a lot of great stories. We're going to have a lot of fun this morning. I'm so glad that you're here to take the journey with me over the next hour or so. And like I mentioned a moment ago, we are sponsored by the French Lick Resort, which is an absolutely spectacular place, folks. Their Pete Dye and Donald Ross design courses were ranked number one and number two in the state of Indiana by Golf Week. It was the site of last year's Senior PGA Championship, and not all that long ago they hosted the LPGA Legends Championship as well. Go to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself how great it is and to book your stay. And every week here... On Next on the T. You know, we like to kick off the show by saluting and thanking the brave men and women serving in every branch of our military who are tuning in around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. We want to thank all of you for the daily sacrifices that you and your families are making to protect our freedoms and our liberties. We also want to thank our veterans out there for all that you and your families have done for us over the years. It's through your strength and your efforts that our way of life is even possible. Folks, if you happen to see a member of our military when you're out and about, wherever you might be, in the airport, at a restaurant, the grocery store, you know, wherever, please stop for a moment and tell them thank you. They are our true heroes. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz and the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It continues to be an honor for us to have Next on the TV be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. And I also want to remind our veterans out there, be sure to continue to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. It is a great site. You're going to find news and articles and a wealth of information specifically geared towards our veterans out there that I'm sure you're going to find both interesting to you and beneficial. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. And I also want to send out a thank you to our great friends over at Podbean. What a great podcasting site it is, and they have made Next on the T their podcast of the week. We really appreciate your support, you know, and what you're doing to plug our show this week. It means a great deal to us. Folks, you can find our show, Next on the T. You can find it out there on Podbean as a podcast at podbean.com. All right, now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Russ Holden. Russ is the founder and the CEO for a wonderful cause that has become near and dear to our hearts, and that is Caddy for a Cure. They raise money and support several charities, including 
the Operation uh, Operation Warrior Golf that helps our wounded veterans out there and you know get back to playing the game of golf. They also donate to charities trying to fight uh, childhood cancer. Russ was a caddy out on the tour for 17 years, caddy for guys like Bernhard Longer, and he was also an All-American in college at Malone University up in Canton, Ohio. And I am thrilled that he is back again and next on the tee with me this morning. Good morning, Russ. Thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, good morning, Chris. Uh, great to be with you. And uh, I'd like to reiterate and just thank you all those men and women listening right now, uh, serving our country and protecting our freedoms. Uh, it's just a thrill to uh, to be here uh, knowing that you all are listening. Uh, hang tight and uh, know that we got your six. There you go. Thank you for that. So, Russ, you know, update us. What Talk, talk about all the great things you guys are doing and have coming up uh, at uh, Caddy for a Cure. Well, you know, Chris, uh, Caddy for a Cure, as you mentioned, uh, I caddy for Bernhard Langer for a long time, and uh, I had, uh, I was having the, it was like a kid in a candy store. I was having a great time uh, being inside the ropes. As you mentioned, I also tried to play uh, for a living for a brief period of time. I decided I liked to eat on a regular basis, and it wasn't going to allow me to be able to do that. So uh, there I was serving as a club professional uh, down here in South Florida where I'm based, and uh, Bernhard Langer happened to be a resident at the club where I was uh, stationed at. And uh, he and I hit it off back in the mid-'80s and uh, first started out on a coaching uh, level, and, and he asked me to caddy for him. And uh, I realized that uh, through all the life of golf that I'd gone through, uh, I'd never caddied my whole life. I'd worked every other aspect of the business, but I'd never caddied. And there I was caddying on the PJ Tour in a major uh, for Bernhard Langer, and uh, I was hooked. I knew that this was – you know, as Ma Bell used to say, the the next best thing to be in there, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I had a great time, and uh, I was just a fill-in for uh, Bernhard's longtime caddy, Pete Coleman, and I ended up being a, a thorn in Bernhard's side, just bugging the living daylights out of him, uh, you know, for every chance that Peter couldn't make it or didn't want to come transatlantic uh, to work at an event here in America. I, I was Johnny on the spot. So uh, fast forward a little bit. Uh, as you mentioned, I was touched by two young children, uh, touched with a, a rare bone marrow disorder called Fanconi anemia. And uh, we were, first time in my life, we were living, breathing, and literally dying with this disease. And I knew that somehow, somewhere, I wanted to make a difference in that uh, disease. So uh, 2001, Bernhard invited me to caddy full-time for him, which ended up being about six and a half years. And again, there I was rubbing shoulders with the likes of Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson and Sergio Garcia and all the great players. And I knew that people would make a donation in exchange for being able to come be a caddy for a day. And uh, I went to the tour and uh, talked with some of the great people up there in Ponte Vedra, and uh, they uh, wrapped their arms around us and said, yeah, we're all behind this. And uh, it's ended up being a a 15-year a, a experience now, uh, going into our 15th season next year, and uh, it's just been fantastic. The military aspect of, of how it all came about was we were in uh, – Bernard and I were down in San Antonio, site, uh, home of the – Brook Medical Center, as everyone listening knows, and uh, the tour being very military patriotic, walked six young men down the range that had all uh, experienced some really extreme injuries. Most all of them were amputees, and uh, they were actually the same age as my son. And uh, here I was, and Chris could come out and caddy for Bernhard Langer, and I had an idea. I said, why couldn't we be escorted by a wounded service member? And uh, I went and made the plans for that program, and that's really morphed into really the emphasis of what we do now. And, you know, as I alluded to in the intro, Russ, you've got uh, the 10th Annual Caddy for a Cure Liberty Mutual Invitational coming up in December down there in South Florida. Talk about what that event's all about. Yeah, this has really turned into a great event. We wanted to have a uh, originally a, a place where we could bring all our former caddies in and some of the people in the local community, and uh, it's kind of kind of just grown, exploded with the support of Liberty Mutual and, and their insurance company uh, in, into a, now a two-day event. Uh, and, and really, it's a, it's a place for us to be able to honor our, honor our military. We bring in many of the wounded service members that have participated in our program. Uh, this year, we, we've got uh, a keynote speaker that to me, it's just really over the top. We've been really blessed. We had General George W. Casey a couple of years ago as our keynote speaker. We had Lieutenant Colonel Allen West as our keynote speaker. Uh, and this year uh, really is going to be yet another great year. We've got Vice Admiral Joe Kernan. Uh, for those of you listening, uh, uh, Admiral Kernan uh, had a illustrious 36-year career serving the Navy as a SEAL. Uh, he 
ended his career as deputy commander down here in Southern Command in Miami, just south of where we were. He was actually senior military advisor to Secretary of Defense Robert Gates uh, when he was uh, serving our country. And uh, he is incredibly charismatic. He's a great guy, and he's going to be here and participating with us and uh, will actually give us a, a great message after golf. And, and what an honor to be able to have him here uh, participate in our golf tournament. And, and Russ, you know, you guys also support Operation Warrior Golf, right? And uh, you know, for for our listeners who weren't with us last time, talk about what that organization does. Well, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I had a I had a vast teaching career uh, working really with one of the best players of all time in the history of the game, and uh, I, I got to grow as a, as a teacher. And I miss it. I miss being out on the tee uh, teaching. Not not everybody, but uh, majority of them. Uh, I, I really miss that 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 teaching opportunity to be able to get somebody look in their eyes. They want to get better. And uh, I want to help them and, and take my experience and my education uh, in the world of golf and be able to apply that. So, as I mentioned, we get these men and women that come through and they 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 participate with us in our program. Uh, you got Sean McKeel coming up; he's been a participant in our program. So what will happen is we'll take a wounded service member and they'll come out and uh, uh, they get treated to an inside the the ropes look at the PGA Tour and then world of professional golf like there's no other. And we form a relationship. Um, you know, my wife and I uh, consider this really our patriotic duty and our service and our ministry to be able to just wrap our arms around these young men and women. And uh, like anything in life, we become very close to some of them and have a great time with the other ones. But uh, what we wanted to do was we were looking for a way to continue our relationship. And uh, what we're really trying to do as a PGA golf professional is growth of the game. I'm trying to introduce these men and women to the game at its highest level, knowing full well the therapeutic benefits uh, for whatever injuries that they are that they're suffering with. We know that golf is one of the best, if not the best, uh, way to be able to do it. So we wanted to elongate that and, and make it a little bit better. So the great people over at V1 Sports, uh, Gary Palace and his team up in Livonia, Michigan, uh, offered to set us up with a golf academy, online golf academy, Academy, so that when we do leave our Warriors, uh, when they leave and go back to their home, they have an opportunity to be able to, with simply a cell phone, send me their videos, and we instantly get notified and we can actually help them with their golf swing, no matter where they are. If they're Michael Procia up in Montana, or they're, they're Sergeant Randy Nance over in Dallas, Texas, or they're Brian Mass right here in South Florida, wherever they are, they can actually have someone take their golf swing, uh, take a video of it, send it to me, and we're able to apply really the best technology in the world today to their golf swing, give them a golf lesson, and they get an instant video right back. So Operation Warrior Golf has been a big part of what we do, and, uh, and now we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wounded service members that have come through our program and have been able to hopefully uh, improve their golf games a little bit. And that's outstanding, Russ. What a what a great thing for uh, for our wounded veterans out there, and and you're also involved in an event called the Wounded Hero Challenge. Talk about that event as well. Yeah, the Wounded Hero Challenge is an event that uh, we we had a we had a dream that we wanted to uh, we wanted to do something that was going to be different. You know, um, many of the events will focus on one aspect of of post service life uh, wounded. We wanted to make uh, really the granddaddy of them all, and uh, we're planning an event up in Portland, Oregon, uh, that hopefully we're going to be able to pull off uh, next year uh, that would bring a bunch of our wounded in and, again, find a unique twist to be able to uh, honor them and thank them for their service and uh, be able to give back to uh, many organizations. You know, we're partnered with Birdies for the Brave. Uh, Birdies for the Brave uh, was started by Phil and Amy Mickelson in 2005, and it is the military outreach of the PJ Tour. And uh, underneath that, they have some awesome uh, organizations, the Green Beret Foundation, the Navy SEAL Foundation, uh, Operation Homefront, Military Warrior Support Foundation, uh, some awesome organizations that really cover many, many, many different aspects. And uh, we're just honored to be able to raise money for them and then as well offer these experiences to uh, wounded service members and, and, and really do our uh, community uh, part in, in being able to say thank you to all the men and women that raise their right hand and say we want to protect our freedoms. 
You know, Russ, one of the organizations that we're proud to partner with here on the show is the Salute Military Golf Association and PGA Pro Jim Estes and the great work that they do. And they do some similar things with our wounded, you know, veterans to, you know, teach them the game of golf or relearn, you know, how to play golf after, you know, after the injuries that they have suffered. And, and plus the benefits that golf has for our veterans, you know, to, you know, to help them better deal with things like post-traumatic stress disorder or other psychological issues that, you know, that they are dealing with. Talk about the impact that you've seen and the therapeutic effect, uh, effect that golf is having for our wounded veterans out there. Well, anybody that's listening and plays golf knows that uh, this is one addicting sport. Uh, all you need to do is hit uh, one shot, that one shot, that, that really comes off exactly like you planned, and uh, you're kind of hooked. Uh, you know, there's there's really no other things out there that uh, I can think of that uh, would really be better for me to uh, be able to throw myself into. And, you know, this game takes three, four, and five hours at times to be able to go out there and that, that, that just that, that search of, uh, you know, Ben Hogan said the secret's in the dirt, to be able to go out to the range and be able to hit balls. And what we find is that the men and women specifically suffering with PTSD and, and, and some of the other emotional TBI and some of the other emotional disturbances that, that these people have, it, it gives them a respite. It, it gives them a couple of hours that they can go out there and totally engulf themselves in something that takes their mind off of whatever it is that's bothering them. And, uh, gosh, uh, th- there are very few other things that can have this kind of impact. Um, you know, we work with a real good friend up in Orlando, Tom Underdown. He started a program called Fairways for Warriors, and he's got clubhouses uh uh, he's built just a, a brand new facility in Orlando there that is just over the top wonderful. Um, they tried to get a golf course, it didn't didn't work out, and I think they've built something even better. It's about a 7,000 square foot facility up there that's a clubhouse that they have indoor uh, teaching facility where they can do simulator, they can do track man, they can do all kinds of stuff. But it's a place where all these men and women can come together and bond. And, and, you know, there's no other thing out there, no other sport out there that really creates the bonding type of atmosphere that golf does. I mean, it's just amazing. And uh, our own experience now over the last almost 10 years uh, of doing what we've been doing with our military, um, you know, my goodness, where do I sign up? This golf thing is just the greatest thing that I've ever seen to be able to, to, to get a man or woman suffering from some of these these, these really – problematic disorders uh, uh 22 men or women a day give their lives take their own lives and uh that's just a staggering number that uh we need to fix that and, and to me being a golf professional i'm kind of biased but i think golf's one of the best avenues to be able to fix that no nah, that is great uh, fairways for warriors that is outstanding i looked that up online and get some information out about that so thanks for sharing that yeah. that story russ and and, and Russ, for you guys, you know the the caddy opportunities and and some of the you know you know folks that you know people have had the opportunity to go caddy for and caddy for a cure are absolutely the biggest names in the game of golf. The 2017 caddy opportunities. When are those going to be available for people to go check out and bid on? Yeah, our schedule is dynamic in nature, and uh, you know, with the new season starting uh, just now, we're uh, we're just fixing to go out and uh, start lining up some of our people. Uh, you know, we, as you mentioned, gosh, uh, Jordan Speed, Jason Day, Ricky Fowler, uh, uh, Rory McIlroy. Uh, you know, all all the guys out there have been really fantastic uh, to be to to say, hey, look, we'll we'll put we'll put Chris Mascaro on the bag today, and gosh, could he uh, he be escorted by uh, Sergeant? Lido Santos. Uh, what a fantastic opportunity to be able to give back. It's kind of a no-brainer for the uh, tour professionals. And uh, the good news is, is after a lot of hard work and after, uh, uh, like I mentioned, 15 years of, of doing this, um, I'm actually approached by the tour players now. And I uh, never really ever dreamed that that would happen. That when I see That's them, uh, they, they, they know what we're all about. And, and they actually uh, come over to me. And I mean, I can't tell you what it feels like to have a Padre Harrington, a three-time major uh, in his caddy, Ronan Flood, that come over, walk over and say, hey, what week are we going to do caddy for a cure this year? Find us 
somebody really nice and, and please by all means put a wounded service member uh, with us. We want to be able to shake their hand and uh, uh, that's probably the best part of what we do. Here we've got a wounded service member and they're going to be with a three-time major champion. They're going to be inside the ropes in front of all these people. They're going to have the time of their life and uh, I think the tour players are actually more excited to meet uh, the service member than the service member is to meet the tour player. Uh, what, what, a, what a unique twist. Yeah, no, that is absolutely fantastic. And yeah, the, as you you know, listed off the names of of guys that you know have you know partaken in. I know Mr. Nicholas was was somebody that was also a part of uh, the program. So, you know, kudos to all of those guys for you know for stepping up and you know and, and like you said, now volunteering and wanting to know how can they you know get get to be a part of this thing. That is absolutely great stuff. And uh, look forward to Russ, uh, you know, hearing who uh, who's going to be a part of it in 2017 as well. And Russ, when you and I were communicating a few weeks back, and you, know, you were talking about doing some things with singer Dave Bray, who served in the Navy mm-hmm. as an uh, 8404 FMF corpsman in the uh, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marine, stationed out of Camp Lejeune up in North Carolina, he is a you know strong supporter of our veterans and you know our active duty members as well, and our first responders. On top of that, so you know he is doing some wonderful things you know, for our military and our military personnel. Talk about how you guys got in contact with one another. Well, you know, it's really crazy because uh, he – he he's he's just one of my all-time favorites. Um, if if you remember, Dave Bray was with a group called Madison Rising, and uh, Madison Rising actually uh, had a, a version or a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner that uh, Dinesh D'Souza uh, decided to use at the end of his first movie uh, about America uh, four or five years ago. And I, I sat in that movie theater uh, just overwhelmed with emotion uh and i i don't even know how many youtube view, views that has i mean uh, go ahead and and, and uh, youtube uh madison rising star spangled banner and when i heard that i was just like oh my gosh the, you know these guys are are over the top so i reached out to them i thought oh you know there's no way that we could we could get one of one of that we could get this group to come to our golf tournament how cool would that be to uh, be able to honor our men and women and have uh, Dave Bray and Madison Rising come. And Dave, Dave parted ways with Madison Rising earlier this year, and he's out on his own right now. And uh, we have our Liberty Mutual Invitational coming up, and, and Dave's actually coming down and uh, going to perform a concert Sunday night, December 11th. Uh, we're going to have a little shootout. We're going to have a little nine-hole shootout supporting uh, a local hospice uh, here here in Boca Raton. But uh, Dave Bray is going to bring his – uh, patriotic music. I mean, to hear him sing the Star Spangled Banner, to hear him sing God Bless America, America the Beautiful, and uh, he wrote a song about our first responders uh, called Last Call. And uh, unfortunately, with all the trouble that our country's experienced this year, uh, that song ha- has has really risen to the top and, and, and an incredibly powerful song. Dave Bray is uh, just totally unique. He loves our country through and through. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, hey, we're calling it a patriotic rock concert, and we're going to host that at uh, TPC Heron Bay uh, here in Parkland, right on the border of Parkland and Coral Springs in South Florida, just outside of Fort Lauderdale. And uh, we're offering uh, free admission to all military, active duty or retired, and one guest, and all first responders and one guest. So our hope is we can get several thousand people out there and uh, let Dave Bray light it up uh, for our USA. Ah, that ought to be a great event for for you know the folks listening in that want to try to you know be a part of that event or get more information and all that sort of stuff. Is there a is there a website? Is there a place they can go to to uh, get more involved? Absolutely, yeah. Our our website overall is caddyforacure.com, and uh, Chris, we spell that with a Y. C A D D Y F O R A C U R E Caddy for a Cure dot com all spelled out, and uh, if you just want to go to the uh, golf tournament Dave Bray side uh, forward slash Liberty uh, for our Liberty Mutual Invitational, just forward slash Liberty, and uh, you can see all the golf tournament. You can see the people that are coming. Uh, you know, past years we our good friend over in Houston, Roger Clements, has come over. Uh, local standout. She's just a, a mile or so away from us right now. Lexi Thompson. Uh, LPJ superstar has come over and participated. Laura Diaz, 
from the LPGA and uh, a few other local celebrities, Sean Wooden from the Dolphins and Eddie Jones from the Miami Heat. Uh, we get quite a few celebrities uh, locally and, and around the country to come on over, but uh, this is just a great opportunity to come on, come on over. We've got Abe and Louie's, one of the finest steakhouses in the, in the world, uh, based in Boca Raton in Boston. They're going to be here serving – uh, some food for us. Uh, many of the listeners out there are very familiar with Mission Barbecue, uh, started by uh, Kevin Plank, uh, started uh, uh, and Bill Krause, started uh, Under Armour. Uh, Mission Barbecue is a great uh, uh, barbecue house, open in places up all over here in Florida and all over the southeast. But uh, Mission Barbecue really says it all. Their mission is really to honor our men and women uh, in uniform, whether it be first responder or, or military. Uh, they're going to be out there serving some of the best brisket I think I've ever had. And uh, uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, this is going to be the uh, 10th year they've supported us. Uh, we're going to have uh, some uh, some southern Southern Chicken Biscuit for breakfast uh, there in the morning. Uh, Chick-fil-A, another great supporter. Chef's Cut Jerky, and on and on and on. We've got some great food, some great drink. Casamigos is going to be there live uh, serving us up a little taste of tequila, so we'll have a good time out there on that. <laughs> and uh, uh, just, an, just an awesome event. We've taken my 30 years as a golf professional, almost 30 years working on the PJ Tour, going to some of the best events, really, that the world has to offer on a week-by-week basis. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not shy in saying that we've cherry-picked uh, some of the best things that happen at all these events. And uh, we're, we're mighty proud of the fact that uh, we put on a really good show for our our contestants and uh, anybody would like to play, uh, go to caddyforacure.com forward slash liberty and uh, you can sign up there and uh, we'd be we'd be thrilled to, to see you. Come on over. That's awesome. So so many great things that you guys are doing, Russ. Kudos to you and to uh, and to Caddy for a Cure and you know all the people getting involved and to Dave Bray and everybody. It's just it's wonderful what you guys are doing for for our active military, for the first responders, for our veterans as well. Can't thank you enough for the efforts and the you know, and really you go all the way back to, you know, to having the idea to start Caddy for a Cure. What a wonderful event. What a wonderful man you are for putting all of this stuff together. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for being a part of the show again today, Russ. And before we let you go, remind our listeners, again, how they can follow Caddy for a Cure, whether it's online and uh, over social media as well. Yeah, we're on them all. We're on uh, Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook, uh, but uh, at Caddy for a Cure, C-A-D-D-Y-F-O-R-A-C-U-R-E. And uh, we try to keep it uh, pretty inspirational, and uh, we don't really have to try very hard. Uh, the men and women that come on out, uh, we're, we're just so humbled, uh, uh, literally bringing us to tears and bringing us to our knees to, to be able to see these men and women and, and realize when you're with them, you realize, and all the people out there that are serving right now, you know that uh, uh, our country doesn't really recognize the, the sacrifice that, that's being given by so many people. For us to be able to just be on the radio right now and talk the way we are right now, and we see it firsthand. You know, we're, we're faced with uh, uh, one of these men or women coming in, and, and we're, we're there to have a good time, and it's golf, and it's fun. But uh, we see the pain. We see the agony. And uh, we're just so humbled to uh, be able to hold this torch for golf uh, in a very, very small way and uh, give whatever it is we have, whatever tools that we have uh, through our gifts as a caddy and be able to say, hey, let, let's try to make a difference in this person's life. So thank you, uh, everyone listening. Uh, really, we, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's outstanding stuff, Russ. Thank you so much for sharing you know, all the information and all the things you're doing, and, and we, like I say, moreover, for doing what you're doing you know, for our service men and women. It's really outstanding stuff. I can't thank you enough for that effort and for you know, coming back, taking time out of your morning to come back on the show. I hope you'll come back you know, you know, probably after that event and, you know, share, you know, share the experience for what it was like and, and, uh, you know, all the great things that, you know, that took place. Love to hear the stories that come out of such a wonderful event that you guys are having down there in, in December. So thank you again for all of that. Good deal. Yeah, I sure will. Anytime you want, Chris, I'd be honored to be on your show. Thank you. All right. Take care, Russ. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. In between now and then, all the best to uh, you and your family, my friend. God bless. Thanks, Chris. See you. That is Russ Holden, again, founder for Caddy for a Cure, and they spell it again, C-A-D-D-Y. So Caddy, the, the word for F-O-R-E-A-C-U-R-E, Caddy for a Cure. 
dot com. What great stuff with our military that they are doing uh, to help our brave men and women, to help all of you out there for uh, for the wonderful things that that you do for us, and they're giving back in a in a wonderful way. And again, check out Dave Bray. What a what a great uh, what a great singer he is. Madison Rising was the group that he was in prior to going out on his own. But the Star Spangled Banner, and I looked at it on YouTube, absolutely moving. Go check it out for yourselves as well. All right, before we get to my next guest, Sean McKeel, we want to give a shout-out to our friends over at the Bobby Jones Company. Folks, cold, damp, winty days, right? They're on their way, and they're game changers. But you can beat the odds with Bobby Jones layers, from quarter-zip pullover, super soft sweaters, to, you know, to their great golf apparel and their polo shirts as well. Check out all their great styles by going to bobbyjones.com. And while you're on their site, click on the equipment link. You know, to see the great line of drivers, fairway woods, and hybrids designed by one of the game's most influential equipment designers, Mr. Jesse Ortiz. And, and uh, Jesse, like his father, Lou, and even Bobby Jones himself, has a passion for the game of golf and golf club design. Do you remember his great tri-wood metal fairway woods from back in the day with, with Olimar? Well, now he's putting his creativity and innovative designs to work, creating great golf equipment for the Bobby Jones Company. You can check it out online by going to the Equipment tab on bobbyjones.com, or you can go directly there to bobbyjonesclubs.com. And I also want to you know, send out a, a, a great welcome to our new sponsors over at the Orange Whip Trainer. You want to talk about a, a great training aid to help loosen you up and you know, improve your golf swing? Boy, what a great training aid that, place, that is. And, and, folks, I've got one. It's helping me loosen up before my rounds. It's improving my club head speed. Check them out online at orangewhiptrainer.com. All right, we're going to get to uh, my next guest, Sean McKeel, on the other side of the station identification. You're listening to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, heard around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line after being away for far too long is 2003 PGA champion Sean McKeel. Sean has you know, been a wonderful friend of the show. We, uh, we're very blessed to have him join us several times in the earlier part of the year. Like I say, missed him very much, but he is back with us again and next on the tee with me this morning. Hey, Sean, I've missed you. How you been, my friend? I've been great, Chris. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. So, Sean, I, I, I saw the picture that you, you posted recently uh, of your family a few days back. Your father, he looks great. How's your father doing? Uh, he's not doing too well, Chris. Um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely posted some pictures of him kind of over the last, you know, eight or nine months. Um, and, uh, you know, I've kind of seen the, the change, but he's having a tough time right now. And, um, uh, he got a really bad headache. He's had that for about a month and, um, you know, he, he, I don't think he's going to do any more treatment. I think he's done. So, um, you know, we've got an appointment on Tuesday with his oncologist and, um, you know, I don't know what's going to come of that, but, um, you know, he told me last night at dinner that he was done. So, uh, I, I can understand it's been a, it's been a very trying time and very difficult to watch, uh, kind of someone's health decline, um, so quickly, but, um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time with him, as you know, over the last, you know, eight or nine months I've, I've, you know, I wouldn't say that I put my golf on hold. I definitely put my father at uh, the top of my priority list. And, um, when there were times I could get away, I, I did that. Um, my sister who lives in Madagascar is coming home on Thursday um, you know, as you know, my mom passed away six years ago in October. So, uh, it's just been he and I here and we've been very lucky to have, uh, you know, my family, uh, Stephanie and, and my in-laws and, and he's got a great support group of his friends around here to, uh, to make sure that he needs anything if, if I'm not available or have been out of town and I haven't done a whole lot of traveling just because of things that have been happening. But, uh, Anyway, it's just it's just really difficult to watch, and, and these types of things happen every single day, and uh, it's just kind of hard to go through it for a, for a second time. So, um, but but we're managing, and and uh, you know he's he's doing okay right now, and um, be anxious to get my sister home. And for those who don't know what we're talking about, your father is waging a, a battle against brain cancer, right? Yes, yes, he has uh, glioblastoma, which. Um, I think, you know, look, all cancers are bad, um, you know, but in the realm of things, uh, the the GBM, the glioblasto multiform, as they call it, is a stage four. It is a, unfortunately, a, a fatal disease. There is no cure. There's, um, 
once it's diagnosed, it's palliative care only. Um, the surgery that he had, um, you know, went very well. It was resected. Most, the majority of the tumor was resect, resected, but it's a, it's a difficult tumor to treat um, just because it, it spread so quickly and there are, are different, you know, glio cells, as I've come to learn, that kind of are around the brain and stuff that, um, that hide and wait. And it's really, um, you know, if it really wasn't so sad, I think it would be fascinating really how these, uh, how these diseases are able to kind of outsmart our own body and even some of the treatments that we're having. I mean, that's the thing that I'm finding. You know, all these things that they're throwing at it um, seem to work for a little while, and then uh, the disease seems to outsmart uh, all of the all of the medications and and uh, everything else. So it's 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 uh, it's unfortunate, really. Uh, you know, I guess in the time that uh, since he's retired, he's he's uh, enjoyed his life. Uh, of course, my mom, you know, when she passed, that was a obviously a very devastating time. But after he moved moved beyond that and uh was really enjoying his retirement uh with his friends and and uh, and all of us of course and and travel a little bit with me it's just uh just really kind of sad to see kind of how all this really happened so it's uh, again it's been a it's been a very it's been a very tough year but uh I've certainly enjoyed you know enjoyed the opportunity to uh you know I guess really uh, I don't know I guess I've spent the last 8 or 9 months kind of thanking him for you know, kind of getting me in, involved in golf and, and uh, you know, without really saying it so much, I haven't said that to him yet, but I think he knows. Sean, over the, uh, over the last several weeks here on the show, we've been having folks, you know, share their memories and encounters with Arnold Palmer. I was curious to, to uh, you know, kind of go back in time <clears throat> with you, and uh, when was the, the, get the, the first opportunity you had to meet Mr. Palmer? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, it would have been, uh, you know, I was kind of a floundering PJ Tour pro up until about 01, 02. You know, I'd, I'd been on tour, but I hadn't met Mr. Palmer yet. Uh, it was probably, you know, around Bay Hill 2004 uh, after I won the PJ Championship and, uh, you know, was, was playing in his event um, that, that I got a chance to meet him. I never really spent a whole lot of time with him. I mean, I, I there was a, a couple of outings and stuff that I had done, um, you know, where he was part of it. Um, so I didn't really get to know him too well, which is really too bad because, uh, his love of aviation, I don't think it trumps mine. I mean, you know, aviation was my first love and, uh, to this day it, it, it's the top, right. it's, uh, at the top of the ladder for me, even over golf. Um, but, um, you know, in 2000, I guess, well, 2004, yeah, my first masters, I got paired with Jay Haas and, uh, Colin Montgomery and of course, that was Arnold's last Masters, and we were paired. We played right behind him, and so it was a rather long day um, there. I mean, um, I was just obviously excited to be there playing in my first one, and um, you know, but he received a standing ovation on every green and every tee box, and uh, it's something that I, I'll never forget. You know, kind of watching him play, and I don't remember what he shot. I mean, of course, I was kind of into what I was doing, but. But again, I never really got a got a chance to spend a, a whole lot of whole lot of time with him. And Sean, I saw you know speaking of posts that uh, you've had out there, I saw your post from from the Ryder Cup, and uh, looked like you were inside the ropes a bit there. How, how exciting yeah. was it uh, you know to be a part of that event? Well, it was uh, exactly. I mean, I um, I was up there doing an outing, and I thought, well, you know what, I might as well stay for a couple of days, and that's what I did. I uh, Originally, when I first got there, um, you know, I just kind of had a credential to get in and get into PJ Hospitality and a few other areas. And as I was kind of making my ran, way around the golf course, I mean, it was like the first time I think in my life that I'd been on a golf course and I didn't really know where to go. Um, so basically what I did was I just jumped in line with everybody else, the kind of mass of people that were going down towards the bottom of the golf course. Now, you know, we did play the, uh, the you know, we had the PJ there, and I believe it was 09, I think. And so the routing was a little bit different um, on the front nine, so I, I wasn't really sure kind of what was going on there. But I got around to the eighth hole, and uh, Darren Clark was sitting there with this, with this you know, former caddy and, and pretty uh, – uh, well, well, great guy, this guy. His name is – we call him Wobbly, and uh, he's caddy for the best in the world, you know. And uh, anyway, he was sitting there in his cart, and Darren Clark was there. Of course, I've known Darren 
for a long, long time. And, and we were just sitting there kind of chatting away. And, and then Davis had seen me. And so he called me inside the rope. So that's kind of how I got in originally. Um, but it was, uh, it was exciting. I, um, uh, on Saturday, I guess it was Saturday afternoon's match. I watched, um, you know, Danny Willett and Lee Westwood play uh, Ryan Moore and, and uh, JB Holmes, and I was around for all 18 holes. And that was uh, just the feel um, of, you know, the crowd and the pressure. I mean, it was it was as I say, it was palpable. I mean, you could feel it. Um, I never made a Ryder Cup team as as when. The Ryder Cups were in odd years until 2001 when September 11th happened, and uh, it got canceled, and so they moved it to even years. And I did get fit for close in 04, but I never did make the team. But it was exciting being there. Um, you know, the crowd, for the most part, was uh, very respectful of both sides. It clearly, <laughs> for the United States team, as, as you would expect, uh, there were a few kind of mean-spirited things, but I think overall <clears throat> the fan behavior was pretty good. And I, I think those are just some of the some things of that? that I've really taken away. Oh, of course I did. did. Yeah, I heard some of it. And I, and I spent a lot of time, you know, walking between holes with, with Ian Poulter and and guys like that. And, I, you know, I talked to Rory McIlroy after his match on Saturday for a little bit. And I felt somewhat apologetic um, to them. And I think they understand that, that – you know, the Americans uh, and the American fans were going to do anything and everything to try to get the cup back, um, you know, because I'd had several discussions with players in Mississippi that, that you know, had the Americans lost that Ryder Cup, it, it really would have been uh, – maybe, it may be tough for the, for the PJ of America to kind of get, you know, get people in, excited about it because we just kept – keep losing. But we played well, and um, and we got the cup back, and I was I was thrilled to to have been there. And speaking of talking with Rory McIlroy, where do you, where do you think the Patrick Reed Rory McIlroy singles match on uh, on the in the final day? Where where do you think that match ranks all time within uh, match play? I don't know. I mean, it probably falls uh, it probably falls right behind the Mickelson Sergio Garcia match in terms of yeah. uh, you know the way the way that the golf was played. Now you know the significance of of that first match was that it was the first match and it was a it was a great. Uh, Oh, it was great golf. Um, you know, they uh, they battled it out. They were fiery. They were kind of, you know, pushing each other along. Uh, you know, um, the crowd was into it. But um, it's hard to say. But that Phil Mickelson and Sergio Garcia match, in terms of just sheer, you know, matching birdies, uh, was, I mean, I can't think of a, of a better Ryder Cup match. And I've certainly watched a lot. And I'm not sure I've watched any really as closely as I did this one or even the last one, but, um, it was pretty good. I mean, the whole, the whole thing was good. There were, there were, um, the golf, I think overall for the three days, uh, you know, with the, with the exception of maybe the first morning, I know that, that Lee Westwood and, uh, you know, didn't play his best and he missed a lot of, a lot of short putts. But I think other than that, it was quality golf by, by both sides. But, um, you know what Patrick Reed's been able to do? I mean, he's kind of the Ryder Cup hero. I think people have equated him to yeah. the Ian Poulter of the American side, and he has fun. He enjoys it. He embraces that. Um, you know, he's, he seems to have that personality for that. That's, not, that's certainly not me. I'm not a, a very vocal person, um, so I would never be comfortable kind of doing that. But I think it's exciting. Uh, it, it really is exciting to see people just kind of let themselves go out there and just be who they are uh, without worrying about any type of criticism. And, uh, and besides that, he's a great player too. So, I mean, great match. But, but again, I think the, the Sergio Phil, Phil match was, uh, was pretty high quality as well. Sean, some folks in the aftermath have sort of complained about, you know, how easy the golf course was set up for the singles matches, you know, pins being placed on some flat areas, easily accessible for the players. Your thoughts, was it set up too easy? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I think the golf course, the the entire week was set up that way. Um, you know, they had some tough pins out there. Um, the greens were really quick. Uh, wasn't a whole lot of rough. I mean, look, there was rough. People just say there wasn't rough. I mean, you know, there was probably as much rough there as any other tour event, maybe not for a major championship, but they wanted guys to be able to get out of it and hit second shots, you know. So, um I know, I know for a fact that some of the pins that, that we normally see, there are three and four from the edges, or six and seven from the edges. Um, but you know what? When you have a golf course 
um, that set up for – they wanted to set it up for scoring because I felt like – I mean, Davis must have felt like his guys were better at making birdies. Um, you know, hard to hard to really, you know, say what, what caused him to, you know, adjust the pins and make it, make it a little bit easier on, on Sunday. But I think he just wanted his guys to go out there and – hit greens in regulation and, and, and feel like maybe they were the best ball strikers, maybe even the best putters. I don't know. But um, I don't know why anybody would complain. The Americans won. So, I mean, you know, whatever you have to do. I mean, there's – I mean, you see Notre Dame. Notre Dame, they, when, they have a, when they're playing against a running football team, what do they do? They grow the grass. I mean, I've seen that in soccer. My kids' soccer, when people, they, they grow the grass up. I mean, you do things to, to take your advantage. It's your home field. I mean, you know, so um, – you know, I don't know. The people that are critical of that have, have either never been around golf that much or have never played or never really cared that much about a Ryder Cup. I, mean, I, don't, I don't really know what, what the criticism is for that. But um, people want to see birdies. They don't want to see a U.S. Open type event where, you know, guys are, you know, hacking out of the rough and chipping it 20 feet by and they, they're two-putting and, and winning the holes with, with pars. I mean, nobody wants to see a hole one with a par. So, it was equal on both sides, and uh, the Americans obviously played better. And, Sean, the U.S. team now is sort of patting itself on the back as if they've sort of found some magical formula for how to win Ryder Cups going forward. Curious to get your thoughts. Have they, or is it just simply like you mentioned a moment ago, moment ago the guys just happen to play better this time around? No, I mean, it's, it's always about the golf. I mean, I, I this no, look, I've, I've not been around the Ryder Cup that much, so I don't really know what all has been kind of going into it. I mean, sure, there are things that you pair personalities up. You look at the people's driving statistics. I think analytics has gotten to be a big part of golf, which, you know, you start starting in baseball with Billy Bean, and now all of a sudden it's morphed into every other sport, you know, and now it's it's approaching golf. I mean, it's it's kind of getting absurd. I mean, to me, it's always been about playing golf. Um at least maybe in the singles matches, it's that way. Um, you know, personalities, um, again, as I said, you know, some of the statistics, who's driving the ball well, who do you pair with um, a good putter. Uh, and, uh, look, all the guys are good putters. I mean, you, you can rank them however you want. But, I mean, they wouldn't be on tour and wouldn't have qualified for the Ryder Cup if they weren't really good at every part of their game. I mean, look, you're not, you know, you're not going to drive the ball straight on every single hole. I don't care how – who you are, how good you are, what your world ranking is. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's just changed. You know, the, the, like I said, the analytics involved with picking a team and, um, you know, picking your, your captain's picks and so forth. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting really how they put it together, but I think it's a bunch of hocus pocus out there i mean i um and of course it's easy for me to say that because i'm not part of it uh i'm sure there's been a lot that's kind of gone into a lot of time has been invested in creating this system um whether it's uh you know having you know vice captains that go on to be captains um i think that has been a, a secret to the european success and and Really, I don't. I think kind of the way that it ought to go, anyway. I mean, usually you're an assistant ca- assistant coach before you become the head coach. Uh, but I do think for years, I mean, guys just uh, I think maybe people thought it was just about the golf. We'll send you know our, our our twelve best guys out there. We'll play a few practice rounds and we'll just tee it up on Friday. And didn't really invest a whole lot of time in the other stuff besides the golf. And um, and maybe that's some of the some of why that the Americans are you know you know, tasted some success this year. I mean, they believe in it. They said there's some sort of formula. So I'm just assuming it has something to do with the, the captains and the vice captains and, and how they're selected and at what point they go on to be, uh, you know, regular, you know, the, the captain. And, Sean, something you, you mentioned a moment ago, the importance of the U.S. getting this victory. To your point, if they had lost this time around, what becomes of the Ryder Cup? Well, it's still there, of course. I mean, I just think that it's just another two years of trying to figure out, okay, what did they do? They had they created this task force. I mean, they did put a lot of pressure on themselves um, by announcing this task force a couple years ago. And, um, you know, I think, uh, well, first of all, it was, uh, I think all of us were kind of like, oh, what is this thing? I mean, again, we go back to it's just really about getting the ball in the hole before the other team does. And um, and then you know I think like again I think there is more to it but but 
it's hard to say. I mean, it, it would have been for two years. It would have been nothing about criticism about this this task force. Where do we go from here? It didn't work. What do we do now? And and all this stuff. Um, you know, I, like I said, I was just talking to a couple of players in Jackson last week, and and the European guys, and they even felt like they said, "Look, this this was important for the Americans to win." Of course, we wanted to win. We tried our best. But in the end, it was uh, probably good that the Americans did win. So, um, I mean, like, who knows? You can't predict what, what's going to happen. I mean, the excitement level of going back to Europe, I mean, it wasn't going to have an effect on the European fans. I mean, they want to keep. They want them to keep winning. I mean, they, they just – I think they uh, – even if they keep losing, even if – I think if the Europeans kept losing, they would still watch um, because I think a lot of those, uh, you know, Euros, I think they're just desperate to see anybody in Europe beat, beat America in general. Um you know, they, uh, I have a, a good sense of that, um, you know, as much traveling as I've done, um, you know, but uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it was great for the Americans to win. We didn't lose, so there's no reason to kind of look into that crystal ball. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, uh, you know, keep this thing going, keep winning. Sean, just a couple more before we let you go. And, you know, we talk about the excitement generated by Patrick Reed and, and you know, what, what he was able to do for the U.S. team. You know, now I think the, the, the thing for him is to harness some of that, you know, Ryder Cup emotion, take it forward into the season and break through and, and you know, potentially get a, get a major. So, you know, for you, Right. You were coming off as, as high as a high can be in, in 2003, right, when you, you won the, the PGA right. Championship. Talk about trying to harness or keep that energy going because it feels like, and I don't know, you know, for the rest of the you know, golf fans out there, but for me, it feels like forever. And I know we got this new wraparound season and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But really, you know, the season doesn't start until January or February, you know, with the regular events, and it's all the way to April for the Masters. How do you how do you try to keep that energy going when you've got such an expansive period of time before really it starts you know it starts counting again? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was you know certainly the the you know, as you said the the wraparound schedule. I mean, the, well things have changed so much since since I won. I mean, you know, you think of the advent of social media. Um, I think what was good for me is that uh, winning in in August. Um, you know, it allowed me to kind of hide a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I did have a, a long run. You think about the PGA champion, and it's, what, four, five, six, well, it's more than that. It's about eight months um, between between majors. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion about uh, – there was a lot of discussion about me and, and, and what I was going to do starting in 2004 and things like that. But, look, I mean, these guys are, are – uh, are facing it each and every week. I mean, there's always something to play for. I mean, you're, you're, you're placing FedEx cup points, you know, the money list that's being kind of thrown out for this, this coming year, um, you know, major championships. And look, he's, he'll, you know, speaking of Patrick Reed, I mean, there's no doubt he'll, he'll get one. He'll, he'll, he'll get at least one, um, you know, these players, he's too good. Um, I don't know. I mean, a guy's personalities are are just such. He seems to be a very fiery guy. For what four, three, four years ago, he was a Monday qualifier um, every week, and he and he and he succeeded in getting his PJ Tour card through that. So, um, I don't know. I think his personality can handle it. I don't think it's uh, like I said. There's a there's a huge difference between he and I, in that I was kind of worried about what was going to happen, and I think he's excited about what's going to happen. I think that's the difference. And, um, you know, it's, I don't know, people are going to have to come to the realization that the, that the year started two, three weeks ago. And uh, that's where we are now. People need to find a way to get energized and excited about these tournaments, you know, these new sponsors that are putting up a lot of money to, to have these events going up against, you know, some of the biggest sporting events. I'm talking about World Series, you know, college football, NFL, and stuff like that. And there's a lot being made of that. But, um you know, people are always excited about the Masters at the lead in. They think that's when the year starts, um, but I don't. I don't see it that way. I mean, it starts from the first tournament that you peg it up in, and um, it was always exciting to play a calendar year schedule. I think that makes more sense, but um, I don't see us ever going back to that. So um, you just gotta, you know, guys are having to maintain a high level at all times because the. The events now are getting so big. The money's getting so large. The FedEx Cup points—they all mean mean something. The Invitationals—it's just, uh, 
it's a long year, and to be honest with you, I'm kind of I'm kind of excited about my next part of my career because uh, you know I uh, I'm not sure I have the energy to uh, to get out there and do it week week in and week out. I mean, I actually uh, am excited about the web.com this year and having having some some built-in breaks. Yeah, so that's the last thing before we let you go. Talk about what you've got planned for for this upcoming season. I know you want to get out on the web.com tour, looking ahead to the PGA Tour Champions as well. So talk about what's next for you. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for the schedule to come out. I do know a few events are going to be starting, you know, early in the in the year. Um, you know, so I'm just kind of waiting to to get the to get the full schedule. Um, yeah, but I'll be playing the web.com out of that 48, 49 category, and it was a category you know, created for, I think, guys that were about to turn 50. And there's three spots every week that are uh, there, and, it, and, and the ranking of those three spots is PJ Tour career money. So, you know, right now I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, it's amazing, though, what happened in 16 versus what's going to happen in 17 for career money. I mean, there were guys that were playing in the web.com tour out of that 48, 49 category that it only made $3 million. Well, now it's going to jump up over $9 million uh, with the majority of players. So the guys that are going to be 49 this year that were playing last year, they're probably not going to be getting in, um, you know, because there's a, there's a bunch of guys are Steve Flesh and Chris DeMarco and, and others. Um, and of course I'm in there, Robert Gamez. And so I, that's what I'm going to be doing. I should be, I should be pretty good for most of the year. Then guys start turning 48 in July and August. Hopefully by that point, I will have made some money, if not one, once or twice and have moved on into a different category, but that's really my goal is to, to get my PJ tour card back through the web.com. So, um, you know, so we'll see, but yeah, definitely for, uh, age 50, I'm looking forward to the champions tour and, and playing out there, but, uh, you know, I'm still focused on the here and now. Sean, remind our listeners how they can stay up to date with all the things that you're doing and achieving out there, both uh, online and over social media as well. Big find me on Facebook at Sean McKeel. And uh, I'm at Sean McKeel PGA on Twitter. And uh, always, uh, always happy to entertain any questions that you may have. I appreciate that very much, Sean. And thank you so much for coming back on the show. Like I said, I've missed you ha- having you as part of the show because you're always so great to talk to you and your insights and, and uh, the stories are fantastic. So hopefully we get the opportunity to have you come back, come back again real soon. That'd be great, Chris. I appreciate it. Always, always enjoy being on with you. Thanks again, Sean. All the best to, to okay. you, your father, and the rest of your family thinking about you. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. All right. Take care, Sean. That is 2003 PGA champion Sean McKeel. And, again, you know, let's, uh, let's keep abreast of all the great things that Sean's doing and uh, root him on through the web.com tour and uh, getting out on the, to the Champions Tour later after that. But a, uh, a finer individual than Sean McKeel you will not find. I promise you that. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the Tee. Before we close up shop, you know how I like to remind you, and we've talked a lot about it during the, you know, the course of this episode, but our friends and partners uh, over at the Salute Military Golf Association and Jim Estes, let's, uh, let's hear a reminder word from Jim. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S. If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. Yeah, folks, what great stuff that uh, Jim and his organization are doing for our wounded veterans out there at the Salute Military Golf Association. Again, to find out more information on how you can get involved, go to smga.org. All right, everybody, my sincere thanks to Russ Holden and Sean McKeel for joining me today. I hope you found the show interesting and enjoyed it as much as I did. 
Please also check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host, Bob Lazari, our announcer, Joe Lajanushi. You know, that show airs live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on uh, Blog Talk Radio and on the Armed Forces Radio Network as well. That show, like this one, like I said at the top of the show, also available as a podcast on Podbean. So thankful to our good friends over at Podbean for making Next on the T their their, uh, featured show of the week, podcast of the week. And uh, you can also find the show as a podcast on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player.fm, SoundCloud. We are all over the net, folks. Uh, On Thursday night, Tailgate, you know, we are joined every single week by uh, guys from the legends from around the NFL. We're a proud partner of the NFL Alumni Association, so we bring you five uh, legends of the game every single week. Please also find us on Facebook. Give us a like. That's important to us as well. And you can find us online on our websites at nextonthetea.net for this show and thursdaynighttailgate.com. Folks, thank you again for choosing to listen to this show today. We know you've got thousands of choices of shows and content to listen to. We really appreciate the fact that you've made Next on the T one of them. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA legends, pros and top instructors, and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Saturday to hear more stories about the game we love from the people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game of golf.